Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and it is my great pleasure to welcome Robin Hanel in today's episode. He is Professor of Economics at Portland State University and together with Michael Albert he developed Paracon, short for Participatory Economics, which is one of the most popular models for democratic economic planning there is and it has been around for more than 30 years now. I really wanted to cover Paracon as thoroughly as possible, leading to more than four hours of material, of which you will hear roughly the first half in this episode. The second part will be released in two weeks. And just to give you some orientation, we begin by going through the model bit by bit. And I kind of spared my critical questions for after the model has been laid out in full. This conversation is part of a small series in which I cover some of the classical models of democratic economic planning by talking to their creators. I already did an interview with David Leitman on multi-level democratic iterative coordination in episode 19 of season two. And soon there will be a double episode with Pat Devine as well. Since all of these episodes are in English and since there are quite a couple of other Future Histories episodes in English by now, we created an English episode-only feed that you can subscribe to. So if you don't speak German and you uh, are simply waiting for the next English episode of Future Histories, please go ahead and uh, take a look at the show notes where you will find a link to the English-only RSS feed as well as the newly created English version of the homepage please share among your English-speaking friends. I'm always very grateful for propaganda. This is really very helpful. And maybe share in all of your different networks too. Thank you so much. And speaking of uh, thanks, thank you Bernhard, Fabian and Wilfried for their kind donations. And there's a special kind of Patreon support that happened. Happy birthday to Daniel from Malte, who became a Patreon supporter of Future Histories as a birthday gift to Daniel. And this is very heartwarming to me, and I, I feel um, honored that this was gifted. So double thanks to Malte and Daniel. But now, please enjoy today's episode, an in-depth interview with Robin Hanel on participatory economics. <music> Welcome, Robin. Good to be with you. It's a pleasure. We will hopefully get into quite some detail about Paracon today, but let's start with an overview and broad definition. What is Paracon? It's an attempt to say something concrete about what it is that we think that socialists um, should be proposing as the kind of economic system in the that we want to replace capitalism with in the 21st century. In the light of all of the experiences um, with different attempts to, to create a socialist economy in the 20th century, what lessons have we learned? And what should we now be proposing? It's, it's, it's our proposal of what we left us who want to replace capitalism with a far better economic system, a kind of socialism that's, that's very democratic and that encourages popular participation. Um, and the, the other thing is that we, we thought that for too long, anti-capitalists have just been very vague about you know, what it is they want um, in light of the Soviet experience in the Eastern European countries and Cuba. You know, in, in light of all that, we felt like reasonable people would expect you have to say something a little more concrete than just your values and your wishes for how the economy should work. Um, so we thought, well, let's let's begin that process by being making some very, very concrete proposals about how all the different kinds of decisions that have to be made, how they might best be made, and then we can all talk about it. So that was the motivation, that was the purpose um, for putting something out there. And then we had to discuss what label to put on it. And we ended up with, well, let's call it a participatory economy. So that was the origins. Um, Michael and I were very much together on that wavelength. And the first books we published about it were back in 1990. So at this point, it's been around a while. 
Um, and, you know, after the fall of the wall um, and the sort of crumbling of the centrally planned economies in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, there's now been a 40 year, a 30 year debate about what should socialists be championing. And, and there's, very school, there's various schools of thought. There's a lot of proposals about market socialism. Um, there's basically proposals about taking social democratic capitalism as far as you can take it. I would call that's Alec Nove. Um, and then there are other people who have continued to say, no, we want a lot more planning than that. Market socialism isn't really what we socialists should be championing in the future. Um, we really need to talk seriously about planning and different forms of planning. So this proposal is one of the proposals that's out there that sort of fits into that 30 year debate. And in, in that context, it's been argued about, you know, in various journals and at various conferences over the past 30 years. And there are some basic principles that inform Pericon, and these are, in short, self-governance through democratic councils of workers and consumers and their respective federations. That's the first one. The second one would be jobs balanced for empowerment, desirability, and caring labor. The third one would be remuneration according to sacrifice or effort as judged by co-workers. And the fourth one would be economic coordination through a participatory planning procedure. I would very much like to go through all of them. Let's start with self-governance. How would democratic self-governance be achieved in Pericon? You did a brilliant job of summarizing the major features of the proposal, so I don't have to. Thank you. First, We, want, we, we we've argued that it's very clear that it's very important to think very hard about exactly what you think economic democracy means. Um, and there's two different views about what economic democracy means that are really dominant. One is, well, it's like politics. I mean, democratic politics is everybody gets a vote. You know, everybody gets a vote and everybody gets the same vote. How else can you do this? In economics, there's also this concept that's been around for a long time that right-wingers like Milton Friedman call economic freedom. And that is, well, I should be free to do with my person and property whatever I want. And we want a system that allows people to do that. And so we have begun that we, we try to begin the discussion by pointing out that both of these approaches to what economic democracy or economic freedom means, they don't apply in most situations. Because particularly when economic decisions are made, what will happen is any economic decision you look at will affect some people more than other people. So one person, one vote works as a notion of economic democracy in those cases where everybody is affected more or less equally by the decision. And economic freedom works for decisions that really only affect me. I mean, what, what color underwear should I put on today? So yeah, of course, we want economic freedom is the right way to make that decision. I get to decide, nobody gets to tell me that. Um, on the other hand, most economic decisions are decisions where some people will be affected, more than one person will be affected, but some people will be affected more than others. So we have begun by saying, let's, let's be clear what the goal is here. The goal is we want to design procedures for making economic decisions so that people would approximately have influence over a decision to the degree that they are affected. And <clears throat> that's sort of That's our starting point in terms of how we go about thinking about what a democratic economy means. And we call that self-management. We define self-management as decision-making input over things to the degree that you're affected. And in some cases, that means I'll have more decision-making authority or input than, than somebody else does. And in some cases, it'll mean I have some input, but I don't have as much input as other people. And in the particular context of workplaces, what a workplace produces and what technologies they use and how they go about organizing their work process 
clearly those decisions affect people in what we propose to be a workers' council far more than they affect all sorts of other people. But it's not that their decisions clearly affect other people as well. What they decide to produce is going to affect consumers. And if they use these inputs rather than those inputs, it means, well, if they use particular parts of land, you know, part of if they use if they use a piece of land, that means somebody else can't use it. So we start with that. We start with that. Um, you mentioned that we also start with sort of a, a position about, well, what would be a fair way to distribute the burdens and benefits of economic activity? And this is something that's hotly contested by socialists and has been for, you know, since socialism first became some sort of an ideology and a movement. What is a fair, dis, you know, how should workers be rewarded? On what basis should people be rewarded? And We've argued that when you go through all of that and you think it through clearly, that a desirable economy would be one in which workers are rewarded according to the sacrifices they make when they work. We've also used the word effort. Sometimes some people, I mean, I know there are times when I'm working harder. I know when there are times when I'm working less hard. And those who work harder probably deserve more compensation. Um, and certainly people who work, who make greater sacrifices than they work. I mean, neoclassical economists call it the disutility of labor. You're working right now, but your disutility isn't very high. You're doing something that you find more or less, you're doing something you find more or less pleasant. The coal miner who goes down a shaft and, you know, exposes themselves to coal dust um, and is sweating and coming home sore at the end of the day is making more sacrifices than, you know, than somebody who, somebody like you or me is during most of the time when we're working. So we just think those things should be taken into account. Those are legitimate reasons for why somebody should be, comp some people should sometimes be compensated by more than others. Now, how you go about doing that. So how you go about arranging for economic decisions to be made according to this principle or goal of, of, of self-management and how it is that you arrange for people to be compensated according to their sacrifice. Well, but at least we understand what we're trying to accomplish. And, and, and we were very self-conscious from the very beginning in coming up with proposals for how you would actually achieve those goals. Now, one thing I'll be very honest about, we did not think about very much back in 1990 was environmental sustainability. Um, so I will plead guilty as long as most of my socialist comrades of my age are willing to plead guilty along with me, because we really should. Um, leftists and socialists, I believe, were Johnny-come-latelys to environmental awareness. We were just so concerned with all sorts of other things we cared about. Oh, economic self-management and economic justice that we sort of took environmental things for granted. And in many ways, we're just like everybody else in terms of being woefully unwoke on the subject of what was happening with the environment. Um, but one of the things I'm really proud of is, and, and this was, I, I will give my, my wife credit for this. Um, my wife is a, an environmental economist, and she brought her leftist husband to awareness about just how negligent me and my fellow comrades were in our thinking about environmental issues. And now I have become, as a professional economist, I teach political economy, I teach economic theory, but for more than 20 years, I've also taught environmental economics. I can almost prove my point about negligence on the left. So I taught in an economics department at American University, known as sort of a heterodox school of economics a PhD program that studied political economy as, reg as, as, as well as mainstream economics. We didn't have a professor, you know, who was a specialist in environmental economics for the first 15 years I taught in that program. And I became an environmental economist because somebody had raised their hand and say, who's going to teach the environmental economics class? And I said, you know, okay, so I'll do that. 
So that's how I became somebody who actually learned enough about environmental economics to realize that you have clearly in the year 2020, clearly any economy to be desirable has to be an economy that's designed in ways that is going to help us protect and preserve the natural environment um, far better than any economic system that people have used up until now. So I very self-consciously now add the goal of environmental sustainability, you know, to economic democracy and economic justice. And we will get uh, to the mechanisms that have been incorporated into Perican in order to address the, this question. Before we go there, maybe you could like guide the audience through this basic setup okay. of institutions. So, within so this is sort of a thumbnail sketch of what the major features of a participatory economy are. Um, we propose that, that we, the first is workers' councils. So we don't have private corporations. Um, workplaces are governed by a workers' council where every worker has one vote. And we can go back to our suggestions or proposals for how it is that workers' councils might want to proceed in their own process of self-governance. Um, but we have workers' councils. We also have proposed that consumers, instead of that consumers be organized into what we call neighborhood consumer councils. Because we want to enfranchise consumers in our planning processes. And if they act as individuals, it's very difficult for us to incorporate them into planning procedures. But if we simply say that we organize cons neighborhood consumption councils where we're talking about maybe 5,000 or 6,000 families that are living in a neighborhood. So these are geographically defined neighborhoods. And we just want the size of the council to be such that you could reasonably participate, you know, by going to meetings, you know, in your neighborhood consumption council. So that's another sort of major institutional proposal that we have. Um, it's a way we think it's important to enfranchise consumers in planning procedures along with workers in their workplace. What's probably most innovative about our proposal, I believe, is that there's two different ways that people have thought you could integrate the interrelated activities of hundreds of thousands of workers' councils and hundreds of thousands of consumer councils. And one would be simply through the market because consumers have to buy what workers, consumers have to get what workers' councils are producing and different workers' councils have to receive inputs. So there is a, you have to coordinate all this. And the two ways that the dominant thinking about how to coordinate all this is, well, you either have to coordinate it through market exchanges, or you're going to need some sort of central agency that gathers all the information and then puts together a coherent plan for how all this could work out. And what we have said is both of those are a disaster that we now can foreseeably predict sort of some odd, at least with a, I mean, hindsight's perfect, but we have the 20th century of hindsight to see what happened when socialists tried to somehow have a central planning agency, you know, be in charge of this coordinating process. And it's not a good outcome. And then the question is, but is there an alternative? And our answer was, you know, there is an alternative. And what's, I think, particularly interesting about it is, I think the alternative is exactly what early socialists always thought would go on if you go back to the late 1900s and early 20th century. What they always thought was, well, these workers' councils, of course, they have their activities are interrelated they're going to have to plan together how that interrelation works out. And so we, we, we very self-consciously tried to design procedures that would essentially take that view of what it is we're attempting to do. Is there some way that we could have workers' councils proposing what they want to do, 
consumer councils saying this is what we want to consume? And is there some way that they could make what I call sort of self-activity proposals and then discover what the consequences of that are and then go back to the drawing board and revise the proposals and resubmit them so that we could find a feasible plan in this way and we wouldn't have a central planning agency sitting on top of everybody saying, well, what you propose doesn't work, you're gonna have to do this. Um, and we wouldn't be using, we wouldn't have market forces, you know, driving the outcome. Um, is there really any reason that we couldn't do things that way? So we've worked on it sort of theoretically, and now we've worked on it with sort of computer simulations to see whether it's something that we can prove under certain assumptions would reach a feasible and desirable and efficient plan under. I mean, this is what economists do. We say, well, if you make certain assumptions about preferences people have, if you make certain assumptions about technologies that, that, that producers have, then under those assumptions, you can prove that some procedure will reach a particular outcome. And way back in 1990, we essentially said under far less rigorous assumptions than you need to prove that a market capitalist economy will reach an efficient outcome. We can say this process, which we think was what early socialists and most people drawn to socialism always wanted instead, this process will work out. This process, could, it works in theory. Um, now, that left the issue of, but is it practical? And we'll come back to this, but I mean, here to, to, to put the issue very, very bluntly, well, so in theory, if we still have, if, if we allow the, the workers and the consumer neighborhood consumer councils to keep making proposals and revising their proposals enough times, in theory, we'll come to a feasible plan that we can start the year with. Um, but what if it takes 1,000 revisions? Well, then it becomes a practical impossibility. So that, that question was left aside until, I mean, the best way to answer it is to convince some country they want to try it. But until that happens, then the only answer is you try and do some computer simulations to see what happens. And we now basically have done that. And we have some, I think, some pretty interesting, you know, at least preliminary reporting that we can do on that subject. Besides the workers' councils that are self-managed, the consumer councils that are also sort of self-governing and participate in the planning procedure, our specific proposal for how it is that annual participatory planning can substitute for a central planning board and markets as a way to come up with a plan. I think that's the, 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 the sort of unique and a, it is unique. And I think it's a very central part of what our overall proposal is. And maybe just for the audience, in order to, to give some orientation, the mechanism that is an essential part of, of this participatory planning procedure that will take up all of this information and uh, process it in a way in, in order to provide some first estimates on how uh, to proceed. This institution is called the IFB, the um, Iteration Facilitation Board, isn't it? Yes. Um, you know, when, when you're creating things and you have to put names on them, You, some choices are felicitous and some are less so. And Michael Albert and I, I remember we, we talked for, I mean, we, we had long conversations about what name do we want to give to this system or proposal? And I mean, I remember one of the early ones we thought of was decentralized socialist planning. And I'm the economist and, and Michael's the political activist. So that, that appealed to me. Um, and Michael argued, and this time, I mean, we, we've had various arguments over the decades. And sometimes I think I've been right. And sometimes I think he was right. And on this one, he was dead right. He said, you know what? I mean, we should call it a participatory economy. If people want to call it participatory socialism, that's fine. If people want to say, well, How does it fit in to left ideology? We can say it's libertarian socialism. 
In Europe, calling something libertarian socialism, it works because everybody knows what you mean. In the United States, that's a huge problem because on, the only people who call themselves libertarians in the United States are right-wing libertarians. So if you say libertarian socialism, you, you mostly just confuse people in the United States. But in any case, we had to come up with some sort of a name. And he was the one that was just very insistent. We, we really decentralized socialist planning. No, no, no. We should just call it a participatory economy. I think he was right about that. The Iteration Facilitation Board is a very unfortunate name. And in anarchist circles, it's also a very hotly contested issue exactly what it is. So besides the name being unfortunate, it's clunky. Um, the real issue is, well, what does it do? And I'll just go straight to the, to the issue here. Um, anarchists, are suspicious that it's just a different name for the Central Planning Bureau, that it's a Central Planning Bureau in disguise. Um, you told us you didn't have a Central Planning Bureau. You told us that this was an alternative to Central Planning, but you really just sort of hoodwinked us. You gave it a different name, but it really is doing what Central Planning Bureaus do. Um, and, I, and, it, and, and so I want to take care of that immediately. This thing, whatever you call it, and we, we haven't got a better name yet, Iteration Facilitation Board. This is what it does. At the beginning of the annual planning process, it announces whatever the current estimates are of the opportunity costs of using different resources, the opportunity cost of using different kinds of labor, um, the opportunity cost of using machinery, stocks of machines that we have, and whatever estimates the current estimates are of the social cost of producing different things. So for an economist, what it does is it announces an initial price vector. Now, in left circles, I don't want to use the word price because as soon as you talk about a price, somebody thinks there's a market. As a matter of fact, as soon as you talk about a price, some people don't even want to talk to you. On the other hand, as an economist, I can insist, I can insist, well, in order to make a sensible proposal about what our workplace wants to do, we have to have some idea of what does it cost society to use different things we're asking permission to use, different inputs. And we have to have some sort of idea of whether or not consumers would rather have shoes you know, or shirts. So you have to, you can't make a sensible proposal without some sort of information along those lines. So this is what the, fifth, the Iteration Facilitation Board does in our annual planning process. It announces some initial estimates of what those are. Now, in our simulations for the first year, we said it's just going to, it's just going to have to announce something arbitrary. And, but in the real world, of course, what it would do is it would begin, it would have a much better initial estimate to offer than just an arbitrary answer to what those things are. It could take whatever they were from last year and say, let's start with those. So in either case, and, 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 and I can tell you something about when we did the simulations, how much difference it makes. You know, if you start from last year, take advantage of some information you already have instead of assuming you have no information. But anyway, they make the announcement. At that point, all of the workers' councils respond with what I call a self-activity proposal. We want to produce this much of these different outputs, and we want permission to use all these different inputs in order to do that. <clears throat> the neighborhood consumer councils submit on behalf of everybody in the neighborhood. So the neighborhood consumer council is gonna to have to approve individual, some, um, individual consumption requests. And we can come back to whether or not that's an intrusive process or not. But in any case, people don't participate in annual planning as individual consumers. It's the neighborhood council that participates. So it sends in, it says, this is the sum total 
of all the approved consumption requests of the people living in the neighborhood. And this is the sum total income that all those people have. And that income can either come, it's either income because they worked and their sacrifice effort ratings gave them that much income, or we're gonna, I mean, obviously you're gonna have social security payments and disability payments. Um, you're gonna have, you're gonna have need-based payments. So all that income basically, and, and so the consumer council responds to how much are the consumers, what's the social cost of making different things? Responds to that by saying, here's what the neighborhood consumption council wants to consume. We've approved, and here is the total income, you know, that we all have. When those come in, supplies and demands for everything will not be equal. So there'll be, when all those proposals come in, there'll be excess demand for a whole bunch of things. And there may be excess supply, offers to supply or availability. Not everything is being used of something. All the Iteration Facilitation Board does is adjusts its estimates of any price where there was excess demand. It adjusts the estimate up. And if it's excess supply, they adjust the estimate down. That's all they do. So, I mean, that has been my answer to the anarchists who, uh, uh, look, Given the history of socialism, it's very sensible to be paranoid about whether anything called an agency in charge of a planned economy is going to turn into one of those evil central planning agencies. So I applaud the fact that somebody really wants to, you know, that, that, that somebody wants to be very careful about that. On the other hand, my answer is what, what authority did this agency exert? What decisions did they make? They didn't tell anybody what they had to propose. They didn't say your proposal is unaccepted. They didn't say, well, your proposal doesn't fit and we need a plan that's feasible. We're going to revise your proposal for you. They don't do any of those things, which is exactly what central planning agencies did. All they do is adjust the estimates that they send out for the next round of revisions and proposals. They adjust the estimates to give us more accurate, to, to, to basically give us more accurate estimates of social, of opportunity costs of using things and the social costs of producing things. That's all the Iteration Facilitation Board does. And Maybe you could dig a little deeper into the question of how these indicative prices are actually being calculated. You state that they are basically estimates of opportunity costs and social costs, but how are these measured in concrete terms and how does one measure opportunity cost, which is foregone benefit basically, uh, for all goods and services if individual benefit is actually a highly subjective and context specific and also dynamic value and this is all additional to the question whether or not individual benefit is really the the right measure to begin with so i i was asking myself how this is being done in in very concrete terms and um, maybe also for someone who's not an economist and doesn't really know about the concept of opportunity costs okay um I'm going to smile a little bit and be a little facetious. I mean, I, I, I and, and so I'm going to be a little facetious and say, part of the brilliance is that it happens organically. So there's two sort of ways you can think about where do these estimates of opportunity and social costs come from? And one way of thinking about it, which is the common sense way to think about it, and it's the way most people do think about it, and I think it's the way that most people approaching socialism have always thought about it, is, well, somebody would have to sit down and sort of try and calculate that and take all sorts of factors into account as part of their calculation. Um, And that's not what, that's not how it happens at all. That's not how it happens at all. Instead, 
I told you that the initial estimates can be arbitrary. And then I said, we start with initial estimates. The workers' councils and the consumer councils respond. That gives us some excess demands and excess supplies that tell us the plan isn't feasible yet. We know to make the plan feasible, the way to do it is to increase the estimate of things that are in excess demand and to decrease the estimate of the things that are in excess supply. An agency does that, but it's a mechanical thing. It's not sitting down and trying to actually do some study that leads to the answer. Now, and the other reason I'm going to smile and claim there's a certain genius at work here was, is, well, but what we proved and all the economists have had to acknowledge is that, yeah, you did prove this, is that under standard assumptions about what people's preferences are like and standard assumptions about what technologies are like, the kinds of standard assumptions every economic theorist has to make in order to do any theoretical study of what would happen in case, under standard assumptions, actually more lax and rest there are some assumptions we don't even have to make that are made to sort of do this kind of analysis for a market system, that this process will lead to two outcomes. The first outcome is, and this is the one that I would think we're more, you know, is more important to us is, the first outcome is it'll lead to a feasible plan where everything that somebody's counting on, I'm, I've been authorized to do this but that means I have to be, I'm also authorized to receive this in order to do it. That everybody will be able to actually carry out the last thing that was approved, that, that, that they proposed. Um, that's the first thing. We've, we've demonstrated that you'll get to a feasible plan. We've also demonstrated that the plan will be efficient. You won't be misusing resources. You won't be using a resource to do something where you're producing something less valuable, whereas if you'd used it for something else, it would have produced something that was more valuable. More valuable to whom? More valuable to consumers, given, it, given what it is they're telling you they want and they don't want. Um, the third thing is that your final estimates of these opportunity and social costs will be as accurate as any estimates of, for, of, of social, opportun social opportunity and social cost you can expect. So it's not that non-economists approach this in a very sensible, straightforward way. Well, you're saying that we, you're saying that we need to know the opportunity cost of using a piece of land. That's probably a hard thing to figure out what that would be. And if somebody were sitting down and trying to calculate it, and try, it would be hard. Basically, it would be impossible. But that doesn't mean that certain procedures will not generate that information. And that's what's happening. It's not that somebody's calculating it. It's that that, it's that, that answer is being generated. And it's generated by the process I've described as the annual participatory planning process. And at some point, there will be a situation where all of the um, councils will have to decide upon whether or not the different uh, proposals are being accepted or not. So maybe let's move a step further within the planning process so the audience can kind of understand the different steps. So we reach the point where there will be a feasible plan, as you call it. So uh, how, how are the next procedural steps then? Yes. If there isn't a central planning agency that says no, well, then who says no if a worker council proposes to do something? They're the only ones allowed to make proposals, and nobody gets to revise their proposals other than them. So what's going to prevent a worker council from doing something that really isn't fair to the rest of us? And what's going to prevent a consumer council for doing something that isn't fair to the rest of us? Let's first figure out, well, what would it mean to do something that isn't fair to the rest of us? For a worker council, what it comes down to is 
you're making a proposal to produce certain outputs, but you're also proposing that you be allowed to use certain inputs. Well, those inputs have a cost to society because if you use them, somebody else can't. And those outputs are presumably for some other worker council that finds them more or less valuable or for, cons for consumers who find them more or less valuable. So there's sort of a, the social benefits of all the outputs that you have proposed, and there's the social cost of all the inputs that you've proposed. An irresponsible proposal, I'm, I'm gonna call it socially irresponsible. It, was so, it would be socially irresponsible for a worker council to make a proposal where the social benefits of their outputs aren't at least as large as the social cost of their inputs. Because if they do that, the rest of us are going to be worse off if they go ahead and do what they did, uh, what they're proposing. What would it mean for a consumer council to be irresponsible? So for a workers council, the real issue is, are you going to contribute more to social benefits than you do to social costs? And, 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 and let me, before I move on, let me point out, as long as you're not, as long as you're, the social benefits of your proposal are at least as large as the social costs, the rest of us are not any worse off if you go ahead and do it. You're not making any of the rest of us worse off. And so why would we care what you do? As long as you don't make me, as long as the rest of us are not made worse off, go ahead and do whatever the hell you want to. Now the consumer councils. So the neighborhood consumer councils are saying, we wanna consume all this stuff. Well, it costs society a lot to make all this stuff. Social responsibility for them amounts to comparing their aggregate income. That is their right to consume socially costly goods and services to the social cost of their consumption request. So as long as the income, the sacrifices from work and the allowances and disability and all, as long as that is sufficient to pay for the social costs of a, cons of a neighborhood consumption council request, well, then they're not asking for anything that's not fair for them to have. If, they're ask if, if it turns out the social cost of that consum neighborhood consumption council request is greater than their income is, then they're being greedy. And the rest of us have every right to say, no, you can't do that, unless you can make some special argument about why it is this year, you know, you've got, there were a bunch of people who got sick and they had medical expenses. Of course, we're gonna have medical expenses free anyway. But so there are special circumstances that might come in. So the, the basic point is there is an easy way for everybody to evaluate First, their own proposal. When you make a proposal, presumably you'd like to know if it's socially responsible. So the only way you know that is to look and see is our social benefit to social cost ratio at least one, if not higher. And then you'd like to know if your consumption proposal is, is, is socially responsible. And that basically comes down to is the social cost of what you're asking to consume, you know, greater than what your income and your fair income based on sort of efforts and needs and things and various things that we've worked out. So you wanna know that about your own proposals, but there's a way to do it. We've got these estimates of social costs and opportunity costs that allow the proposers to figure out whether their own proposal is socially responsible. And importantly, it lets all the other councils do the same which is why you don't need central planners to say no. We've provided the councils with the information necessary so that they can self-police. And do it fairly quickly without a lot of, you know, debate and discussion. And I think that's the thing that, that I'm sort of most anxious to emphasize that aspect of it um, because I think a large part of the reason that people are drawn to sort of models of market socialism is, well, the market takes care of all this for us. And the only alternative is just going to be a tremendous amount of arguing. 
that's just going to go on forever. I mean, one of my colleagues here in the United States, a socialist feminist economist named Nancy Fulbright, um, and early on, her reaction to participatory, you know, the participatory economy proposal was, Robin, you're a really nice guy. I understand what you're trying to do here. We're all in favor of all that. But this is going to lead to the dictatorship of the sociable. By which she meant, and is anybody who's been in the, who, is anybody who's participated in left politics long enough, you know, one of the nightmares is, that the meeting comes, the, the meeting call, is called to order, probably starts an hour late, and there's arguing and debating and back and forth, and we've gone on for two or three or four hours, and sensible people have to go home. And in the end, the argument goes on and on and on, and it's whoever was most stubborn and whoever stayed till two in the morning who finally ends up deciding things. And you don't want a system that comes down to that. Um, and one of the things that I think is very important about our proposal is we think we have made the central planning agency obsolete. You don't need it. And yet we have not burdened people with endless amounts of meeting time and discussion time. And we haven't put people in a situation where the only criteria for making the decision is who was just most stubborn and held out the longest. That there's sort of objective ways to quickly decide, was that proposal socially responsible or irresponsible? And as long as it's socially responsible, whether it's coming from a neighborhood consumption council or a workplace, the rest of us should be totally happy to let them do it. And there's an easy, and, and we think that, and we think that this can all, I mean, we now know from the simulations that this shouldn't take more than five or six simulations to come up with an annual plan, which can easily be done in the month of December. That's not to say that there won't be some special circumstances that need to have further discussion. And we can talk about that. But unless you can take care of the bulk of the decisions in a way that doesn't require, you know, a long trial of some sort or a, or you know a tremendously long and 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 you know long set of meetings um as long as you're only using those procedures for a very small number of cases that really are special circumstances and deserve special attention we think then it's not a practical impossibility maybe as a quick follow up question so I, I absolutely understand that you have this um, notion of let's call it parametric coordination that makes all of these processes very much easier as you just stated. But within these situations where the, the councils decide uh, over the proposals of each other and they do have these uh, parametric uh, indicators that, that are at the end boiling down to a ratio of social benefit and social costs, which makes yeah. it easier to decide whether something is really of social benefit or not. Um, what would be the mechanisms that allow for going beyond this kind of parametric um, decision-making? Because as you just stated, there might be situations in which uh, this is not sufficient. This is not like addressing the, the specific context of a given um, like situation, whether in a council or um, a workers' council or consumers' council for that matter. It might not be sufficient to, to address the, the complete context of the situation. So what would be the the mechanisms to address things that go beyond this parametric uh, evaluation? Yes, but there will be situations where some sort of special consideration, you know, is warranted. So what might that look like? Before I answer that, let me just summarize what it is that any worker council or neighborhood consumer council has to do or not do. It has to make its own initial proposal. It has to revise that proposal, its own proposal. Um, and <clears throat> it has to revise that proposal maybe five or six times. Um, it also has to vote thumbs up or thumbs down on all the other proposals. Now, ordinarily, thumbs up or thumbs down is just if the other proposal didn't have a 
social benefit to social cost ratio that was at least one, our vote is thumbs down. So it doesn't take a big thinking process. So that's all that any worker council or consumer council has to do for itself and its own proposals. And it's when they're voting thumbs up or thumbs down that they're doing what a central planning agency would do in a different kind of economy. Okay. But it's, it's not right. It, it, it does, it shouldn't take any time. Now, what about, so here would be an example. We have a workers council and they've made their proposal and their social benefit, if their social benefit to social cost ratio is one or higher, they don't have to make any appeals. They're going to be approved. It's not. It's only 0.9. So it looks like somehow the social costs of all the inputs they're using are larger than the so, but they know that's wrong. They believe this is wrong. They believe the numbers lie. I think we need to set up what I call appeal procedures. So while the whole plan is being made, it should be possible for a workers' council to say, look, we know there's something going on where the numbers are lying and our proposal really is socially responsible and we want the opportunity to explain that to somebody. And so I think that you need to include that. I mean, in, in a real world version of this, you would have to allow for councils to do that kind of appealing. But notice what a successful, a successful appeal isn't going to be presenting a whole long description of how wonderful they think, they think their workplace is and how wonderful their ideas are. No, no, a successful appeal will have to take the form of the estimates of the social benefits and the social costs is actually inaccurately measuring something that we're doing. And, and I think therefore appeals, as long as appeals are a small fraction of what we have to deal with. And as long as the appeal procedure takes a very coherent form, which is the, the applicant has to basically make a case that they're being charged. I mean, here would be an easy example. There's an, there's an opportunity cost of using a particular kind of machine. And they could say, well, it's right for most of the machines of this kind, but ours are, ours are dilapidated. So it looks like we're using things that have a higher opportunity cost than it does because, so essentially the appeal process takes a form of challenging the accuracy of what's being used to measure in the particular case. The appeal procedure for a neighborhood consumption council might also be on the grounds that, although they could do this out of savings too. So a neighborhood consumption council could say, we were hit by a flood. And, you know, sure, we could go ahead and say, we need a lot of stuff for repairs and it comes out of our income and we can even go ahead and be approved to borrow, but we really shouldn't even be charged for this. I mean, we are victims of a disaster and therefore, there needs to be an exception in our case of what it is that we're asking for. And we shouldn't have to pay for all of that out of our entire income. I mean, you could handle that through disaster relief programs too. But something that's not a disaster relief program magnitude that might not qualify for it still is something that a neighborhood consumption council could appeal. I think for me, for me, the trick is design a procedure where it's only a tiny fraction of cases where you would need appeals, and then make sure that the appeal process is one where the appeal process has some grounds for adjudication that are sort of rational and make sense. So we do have a feasible plan right now. This plan has been approved by all of the different councils, consumer councils and worker councils. So Maybe as an addition that uh, the audience uh, has not yet uh, have as an information, the information that the different consumer and uh, producer councils have provided into the process, this information is aggregated information. It's not 
detailed information. It's not that every consumer council has proposed every detail of each good and, and uh, provided this information for the process, but it's aggregated information. So we are now within our imaginary planning process at the point where we have a feasible plan. It has been approved, but the plan entails more or less broad information about what has to be produced. Uh, what are the next steps? How is this aggregated information uh, transformed into detailed products by the worker councils? So on January 1st, we have a feasible, efficient annual production plan. But, as, but there's two problems. There's still two problems. One is that plan says the categories are going to be categories such as women's dress shoes. It's not going to be size such and such. It's not going to be, I don't remember what I called it, but I had a funny name for it. You know, the, the woman's leather high heeled shoes with yellow toes problem. So the, the plan is going to be in terms of sort of broad categories of goods and services. And yet you have to produce a particular, you know, shoe that might be a little bit different. How does that all get worked out during the year? That's one question. And another question that's, that's it's related, it's a little different, but it's related. And that is by January 15th, something we assumed when we made the plan isn't going to be true anymore. So there's both the, how do you translate broad categories of goods into detailed categories of goods? And how do you adjust for things that happen that were not foreseen when the plan was drawn up? And and here's where the conversation has been very difficult amongst leftists. And I'll give you two examples. The Jacobin dismissed the whole idea of a participatory economy entirely on the grounds that obviously planning, you know, for an economy that has, they, they use the example on Amazon alone. There's so many millions of different goods. So how could you ever plan for how much of those millions of goods? And that's just Amazon alone. Um, David Schweikert, who is a proponent of market socialism, where he says, well, markets can handle this, but you can't. Um, basically said, well, the whole thing is very interesting, this idea of a participatory economy, but it's just nonsense on stilts because it can't handle this. It's been 30 years now since there were any planned economies. Now, there is still a planned economy in Cuba, and I don't know what they have in North Korea, but I, I think it's a planned economy. So, but nobody knows anything about them anymore. So in popular consciousness, there's no memory anymore, apparently, that, you know, the Soviet economy did actually manage, you know, to plot along for you know, going on 50 years in the Eastern Europe. And as, as anybody should now realize, I'm not a proponent of that system. But the whole notion that comprehensive planning is just a practical impossibility is belied by the fact that, well, it obviously wasn't a practical impossibility. It might have been a very undesirable way to do things, but it wasn't a practical impossibility. There must be some way to translate you know, from broader categories to more refined categories. And there must be some way to make adjustments during the year because there were a whole bunch of economies that managed to do that for, for decades and decades. Not to say they did it well. And not to say that it wasn't, and that some of the sort of obvious problems that those economies had, which, I mean, the, the major problem that the centrally planned economies was that I mean, one major problem was they really disenfranchised consumers. 
So everybody's aware of the, oh, yeah, I mean, in the Soviet Union, you know, you could get shoes, but everybody's shoes all look the same. Well, by the end of the Soviet Union, that wasn't really true. On the other hand, the variety that capitalist and market systems have to offer, uh, I don't think that variety was ever offered by any centrally planned economy. So it's a reasonable idea that maybe it, maybe planned economies are not as, as nimble in these regards. But that's what it comes down to. It's not like it's a practical impossibility. We know that's the case. Um, well, here's how you would translate. So you have a plan, you're, you're, you're a workers council and you're making shoes. And you have a plan that's approved to you, you know, that's been approved for you to make certain amounts of shoes, you know, for adult women. And you go ahead and make them. And they get shipped to the distribution centers and people start picking them up. And it turns out that the red ones are going like hotcakes and the yellow ones are just sitting on the shelf. Well, you do just exactly what any capitalist shoemaking business does. You know, you shift over and you start making more of the red ones and you make fewer of the yellow ones. So in terms of detail, it works out in a planned economy just the way it, it, there's no reason it can't work out in a planned economy that is sensitive to what the consumers want. Now, I mean, this is an interesting question. And, 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 and I do think that one of the things that capital, capitalism has done has disempowered consumers um, relative to producers in all, sorts of, in all sorts of important ways. So what it's going to come down to is, so... I'm shipping shoes, but the shoes I'm shipping aren't being picked up. What if I don't change? What if I don't? What if I continue to ship the yellow shoes when the red ones are going like hotcakes? Well, then the issue is, well, do I get credit for that? And another issue is, and this is this, this is sort of relevant to sort of empowering consumers. One of the problems consumers face in market systems is you didn't get something that you thought you were getting. Now, of course, every capitalist business mouths the slogan, the consumer is always right. But it's totally insincere. I mean, what they mean is we're going to tell you you're always right, but we're going to make sure that we, have to, we, 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 we don't have to exchange your product unless we absolutely have to, and we're gonna make it as difficult as possible for you. So, I, I mean, one of the things we've said, suggested is, wouldn't it be nice if as a consumer, something you get delivered isn't what you expected? Instead of you fighting with the person, with the, with the workers council that produced that and delivered that, you just turn it back over to your, consu your, your consumer federation, say, it's unacceptable, and let your consumer federation battle in a much more powerful position with the Workers' Council and its federation about whether or not this was, you know, this was up to specs. So my answer is there are answers to these problems. The popular consciousness, we now have 30 years when none of these economies that were comprehensively planned um, have existed. And so people are having a hard time imagining how it's even possible. There's an analogy to this. Before Adam Smith came along, popular consciousness was, how could, how could it possibly work? How could a market system possibly work? I mean, how will anybody, how will the producers know what the consumers want? So, I mean, feudalism made economic decisions in a certain way. And Adam Smith was saying, we don't need to make economic decisions that way at all. We could just leave, we can have individual producers and, and individual consumers out there. And as long as they can buy and sell from one another in a market, it's all gonna work out. And there was a time in history where people just had a hard time imagining that. And he became famous for saying, see, something you can't even imagine is actually readily possible. And, and I think we're back in a similar situation where we're arguing that you can do comprehensive planning, 
It's not a practical impossibility, but for 30 years, nobody has seen it and everybody just can't imagine it anymore. But I think we've got perfectly sensible answers for how you, how the more broad categories get translated into, in, into more refined categories. It's simply, when it's delivered, some things, will be, some things will be picked up and purchased and some things won't. And you do sensible adjustments when that turns out to be the case. That means you're gonna to have to order more red dye and less yellow dye. And then that's an adjustment that's gonna to have to be made too. My answer to the doubting Thomases is, that's not rocket science. Do you really want to argue about that? I mean, maybe as an addition, uh, you used the, the term that the producers will need to be sensitive to what people actually consume. One might add that, I mean, there are sensors proliferating throughout the world today and we have digital uh, technologies, information and communication technologies that are very much uh, able to sense much more than was able before. So this might also be an, a factor that, that comes that, into play. That's something that is out there in popular consciousness, and I think it's good, which is that technologies have changed a lot in terms of just supply, supply side management technologies have changed a lot. And the ability, I mean, I buy all my books. I, mean, I probably shouldn't admit to this because I'm obviously not supporting my local leftist bookstore. Um, but when I can buy, you know, a digital version of a book I want on Amazon and get it on my, on my, uh, my Kindle, you know, in literally five seconds. Um, yes, I do that. So there's been changes in technology that basically make all of this adjustment stuff a lot easier than it would have been 40 years ago. But I want to point out, so I think that the things we're talking about in terms of how speedy and efficient can the detail and adjustment process be given today's technologies as compared to 40 years ago, actually a lot better. But I don't want to concede. I don't want to. I don't want to concede the point. We could have still had this kind of economy 40 years ago. It just wouldn't have been quite as quick and efficient about making the adjustments. But it would have been fine 40 years ago too. It wasn't like the we didn't have to wait for these new technologies. And there's a similar sort of the the, the socialist calculation debate um, had a similar issue, which was the original objection to you know socialist economies that came from the Austrians um, was, well, it's just too many equations. You could never solve all the, they were imagining central planning and they were saying, there's no way you could possibly solve all those equations. And that's the beauty of the market system. You don't need a huge computer. And, you know, they were right that in 1900 or not when the debate was going on was like, pre-World War I and sort of post-World War I. They were right that we didn't have, you know, powerful computers. And people like, like Paul Cockshot and, and, and Alan Cottrell, they've made the point, but now we do have these computers. So we could calculate a very, very detailed large central plan. And my answer is, yes, we could now and we couldn't then, but we still don't want to, but for different reasons. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we want to do it. But in this case, yeah, of course we would want to use all that new technology to make the adjustment process. You want to adjust for details, you want to adjust for unseen events. And if we've got new technologies that would make all that easier and more efficient, of course that makes the whole thing work better. And we should be very happy about that. So now we have actually transform these aggregated um, information into aggregated pieces for production, inputs for production, and they have been transformed into uh, detailed products by the workers' councils. And from there on, people will go to stores just like they do nowadays and will purchase these items depending on how much um, 
credit, so to speak, they have coming from their work within well, each they, workers' they've council? Been, they've been, so I'm a consumer. And I, not, I had an annual consumption proposal that's been pre-approved. And so now, and I, I, I want to admit to something personally. I, I don't shop. There's only one thing I shop for. I'm the cook in my family. So I shop for, I go to food stores. So I shop in food stores, which is why I know how people shop. Because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever bought a piece of clothing I've ever worn. So I shop for books and I shop for food. When I shop for, and, and, and when I shop for food, I'm a bargain hunter. So that's why I know when I go up and down the aisles, I'm looking to see what the price tag on that thing is today. And if it's not a sale price tag, I'm going to probably pass it up and hope for something better tomorrow. So that's why I know that when people shop, you show them price signals and that's how they respond. But the whole idea of sort of shopping um, is really foreign to me. And I had a group of students who came into my office one day and they said, well, we've been, you know, we're in your class and, you know, you've been talking about this participatory economy. Um, but there's just one thing that we either don't understand or we don't like about it. And, and what they said was, you don't really understand the pleasures of mauling it. And I thought they were saying maul, M-A-U-L. And then, then it turned out, no, no, they meant the pleasures of going to the shopping mall, seeing and being seen, and just deciding on the spot, what do you want to buy or not buy? And I told them, I said, you're absolutely right. Your dream is my nightmare. Being caught in a shopping mall for more than five minutes is the, it would be a death sentence as far as I'm concerned. It's the last thing I'd ever want to do. But I understand, you know, I, you, you have a reasonable demand here. And so that is a question of how do you accommodate that? And so the whole idea, I never thought about how the goods are actually being picked up and distributed. I just thought of people as, well, you're going to your local food store and that's how you get the food that you're gonna go home and cook. But there's no reason that you can't have shopping malls. Um, I remember at one point in time, and I think it's still true in Cuba, they used to do, they, they did these big displays. They wanted to show people in Cuba what new kinds of goods might become soon available that they hadn't been seeing for a while. And so they would do these sort of demos. And, you know, there would be, they would put on sort of like a fair where, where the, 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 the economic ministry was basically saying, come out to think like a shopping mall thing, we're gonna show you new products so you're gonna see the kinds of things. There's no reason that we can't, those would all be good ideas, but essentially my vision always was certain items would get distributed to distribu distribution centers, which really are only for one neighborhood. Other items is probably gonna have to cover four or five neighborhoods, You know the kinds of goods that get sent there to be distributed. But I always envision it as you're picking it up You've got your swipe card. At some point along the line, your swipe card starts to tell you that you're actually picking up more of certain things than, you know, that you had ordered. Do you want to make an adjustment or is this just something that you're going to make up for? That's where the new technology really is, really should help in making the adjustments. Um, but that's the kind of process that, 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 that I think from the point of view of a non-shopper, that's about the best I can say. Yeah, and I'm, I think it's quite important for for many people that there is some form of flexibility still, and that you do not that you are not hold to buying exactly the things that you were thinking of at the beginning of the year. But this could be done in a, in a fashion where 
I don't know if you if you achieve uh, an amount of like 80 to 90 percent uh, of things that you already knew that you will consume this is very good and then if the rest uh, 10 or 20 percent of goods that you consume over the year are those that are being consumed in a more dynamic and flexible and spontaneous way then this is still an improvement i guess so so this that, doesn't that, have that to be an either or situation I, i would concur that that that's the way i think about it too There are two issues. I mean, one is easy to take care of. What if somebody during a year ends up consuming less than they were? I mean, the, the sum total social cost of what they consume is less what the, they're approved for. Well, that's easy. Then they the, just goes in and it adds to their savings in the savings account. Now, what about somebody who ends up consuming more than they were approved for during the year? Well, in that case, they're basically borrowing. And at some point, I mean, I, I don't think you ever have to sit in judgment over us. Over, if somebody wants to save, who the hell is ever going to say no? If somebody wants to borrow and, oh, but you're borrowing every year and you've been borrowing every year for 15 years. And it's kind of becoming clear that you aren't really planning or whether you're planning to pay it back or you're just. You think you're planning to play it back, but it's becoming, you know, rather obvious to the rest of us that you can't. Somebody has to sit in judgment over this. I, one of my daughters works for credit unions and basically has one of her jobs is people taking out new car, you know, taking out car loans to buy new cars. And so she's constantly watching cases where, yeah, you thought you had a credible plan about your payments, but in fact, you don't. So. I think of it more as you're still going to have something like credit unions and the credit union is going to have to sort of, they're going to have to monitor whether borrowing has become um, insincere. But there's total flexibility about saving and borrowing in terms of the grand sum total of what you're spending in a year being different from what you proposed. There's really no problem in handling that. The difficulty is for di particular items. So if, if certain things, for, for a certain item, the grand total amount of, that, that consumers are, are, are taking off the shelves is greater than what was planned for, then we have a decision to make, well, who's going to get it and who isn't? And there you, there you would have a complicated, I mean, there I think you have a somewhat complicated issue. Well, I had it in my order. And so should I have priority over somebody who didn't have it in their order? And there's another issue about, well, do we just also take care of this by adjusting the price? And in, 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 in the latest book I wrote, I sort of discussed these very, what are the pros and cons of handling these situations which will inevitably arise one way or another? And, and I think there are some pros and cons of handling it in one way or another. And, and they are issues that will arise. I mean, I like from the tip of my head, I would say like you could easily reserve some item for a period of time. And if it's not consumed during this uh, time period, it will be free to consume for anybody else who, who's interested in, in the item. And then additionally, um, this uh, question of pricing comes into play, but that's just a, a side note. There is a complementary aspect to this question of consumer flexibility, and that is the question of flexibility on the side of producers, because another thing that the Austrians brought forward, and you mentioned them already in the context of the socialist calculation debate, another thing that the Austrians brought forward is this question of competition as a um, discovery mechanism and the question of uh, how does innovation come into being into the world into how is how is this idea of the new being handled within an economic system so how would Perkin go about this this process of innovation how is it being decided whether or not resources can be allocated sensibly into a direction which might not be like fully developed where the the odds are not 
clear whether or not something might succeed or not. So how, how is all of this um, being decided upon? Yeah, by the way, the I mean, the two, the, the whole Austrian school and the Austrian debate in the popular consciousness in the United States, it's quite different than in Europe. In Europe, you all know the Austrian school. You all know Van, Von Mises. You all know Hayek. And then you know the names of a few other people who I don't. In the United States, the only name we know in this regard is somebody named Milton Friedman, who was not part of the Austrian school, but who, who sort of, he took their arguments, dummied them down, um, also screwed them up to a great extent. And basically that became sort of what is popular consciousness about the impossibility of socialism being sensible to a U.S. audience. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there in terms of, there, there are certain subjects where, where, I mean, it's the same as social democracy. You all know what that means. In the United States, nobody knows what that means. Um, It's the same as libertarian socialism. You all know what that means. And in the United States, it means something very different. But anyway, to your question about innovation. And I think this is a very, this is a very legitimate concern. I think the, the conclusion that the centrally planned socialist economies were deficient in terms of their ability to generate sort of innovative economic activities, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's well taken. And so when I study those systems to try and figure out, well, why, what was it about their incentives? What was it about their decision-making you know, and reward systems that led to such poor performance in this regard? I think there was poor performance and there have to be reasons for it and it's important to understand what they were. And so I spent a decent amount of time studying the logic of central planning and seeing why it would not be in the interest of enterprise managers to innovate. You know, why would they disguise their capabilities rather than sort of try and stretch to. Now, the first thing I would point out is think of, think of a workers' council in, 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 in a participatory economy. Anything they can do. Any innovation they could introduce that would increase the social, the, their social benefits of what they're providing or decrease the social costs of what they're using is going to rebound to their benefit because it's going to make it easier to get their proposals accepted. So if an enterprise could come up, there's, 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 broadly speaking, there's two kinds of innovation. One is anything that cuts down the costs of what we're making or anything that increases the sort of quality and the quantity of what we're producing. So we certainly have incentives, you know, for workers' councils to be searching for all those things. Here is where there's a real dilemma though. Um, what if a workers' council comes up with a new innovation that reduces its social costs or increases its social benefits? And any economy faces this dilemma. So we have one unit that came up with the innovation. It's very inefficient if the innovation doesn't get immediately used by all the other worker councils in the industry. I mean, to have one doing, to have one council in the industry doing something that's more efficient and the rest of them aren't allowed to, well, that seems silly. And yet that's what patents do. That's essentially what a patent does. Now, maybe not forever. Maybe the patent only lasts for 20 years. And once you have the patent, you could sort of negotiate with other firms in the industry and you could, you know, you could negotiate a price and also allow them to use the patent for a certain payment. But essentially what patents do is they slow, they slow down the spread of innovation. Oh, but they also provide a tremendous incentive to innovate. And that's the argument in favor of patents. So my first observation is you really can't have your, you really cannot have 
it seems like you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you want what economists call static efficiency, you want everybody to use the innovation as quickly as possible. But if you want quote unquote dynamic efficiency, incentive to search for the innovation, then you have to prevent its spread. So it seems like there's a trade-off between these two goals. Well, we've taken one extreme position on this, which is any innovation immediately becomes available to everybody else. So we're gonna spread it immediately. Does that diminish the incentive for an enterprise, for a workers' council to look for innovations because they basically can't sort of hoard it? And I think maybe it does. I mean, I think I think we have to honestly say, well, okay, let's consider the consequence of immediately saying all innovations are open to anybody. Um, and then the question is. Well, what can you do? And, and my answer is there's still two things you can do. One is if you actually take a look at research, um, a lot of innovative research in, in the United States, it's sort of, there's sort of a, it's, in the United States, there's sort of famous studies about innovation. And what they've discovered is the federal government of the United States has paid for so much more innovation than anybody realizes. Everybody thinks it's that creative entrepreneur out there who did the innovation. You'd be amazing how much your tax dollars paid for innovation. You'd be amazing at how much innovation your tax dollars paid in the US military, you know, then beca that became important innovation, you know, in res in, throughout the economy. So there's another way to stimulate innovation, which is basically just to pay for it. You have, so why shouldn't we have industry federations with very large research institutes attached and budgets? And why just have industry federations with that? A lot of the innovations have to do with new products from a consumer's point of view. Let's have the consumer federations also have very large research institutes that are associated with them. And then any research that those federations manage to come up with innovations that they, well, then of course those, fed, it immediately goes to all the enterprises in the federation, you know, because, because that's, that's who the members of the federation are. So that's one way. And the other way is, and I've, I've said this, I think it's an important, I think it would be very important for a participatory economy to keep very close tabs on whether they think that the economy is sort of lacking for innovation. And despite the fact that they've got these big research institutes, and despite the fact that if you can come up with a way to improve your social benefit to social cost ratio, it's to your advantage, but everybody else is gonna to get to use it right away too. So if that proves to be a problem, is there something we could still do? And I think, I think there is you simply grant prizes for innovation to individual worker councils. So if you need to dangle a, a sort of material benefit out there for individual worker council innovation, there's no reason you can't do it. I would argue you're doing it at the expense of fairness. I mean, it depends. If you think that innovation is the result of extra effort, then in some sense, it's not even at the expense of, of, of economic justice if you're, if you're paying you know, bonuses for innovations coming from enterprise. Um, on the other hand, if you think that innovation is largely not a result of that, it's sort of luck and innovations are basically, what they really are is it's a whole sort of process through time that takes place and it's hard to say any particular person was responsible for this whole thing. Um, and then I think that simply that, that would simply have to be a decision-making. If the people in the economy felt we're not being innovative enough, we need to do something further, then there's something you could do. I would just quite, I, I, think, it, I think it would be, I think it's important to always be honest about what you're doing, at least with yourself. And in this case, I think that what you might do is say, we're worried about innovation. 
We're putting a priority on it. And we recognize that to some extent, it might be at the expense of sort of economic justice. I think there are there are plenty of, of um, ways to go about this. And some of the, those you sketched, I would definitely totally agree with. And I think that uh, additionally, there might be some type of kind of crowdfunding There, there might be some budgets that are explicitly put away for like some wildcard uh, kind of stuff where people that have an idea, an initial idea, and that like carry some form of risk in the form of uh, resources that are needed and that are not already like covered in some way, shape or form that, that might apply for this kind of funding in, in, um, that is specifically put away for like wildcard innovation or something like that. Well, and the, yeah. crowdfunding, had, crowdfunding is very popular in the younger generation. And it's a pretty big deal. There's a lot of it that goes on. The, the, the crowdfunding that I am most impressed by is that in our elections in the United States, Republican candidates traditionally always get or are, are much more adequately funded than Democratic Party candidates because the big core, they're getting the big corporations and the wealthy contributions. And we basically don't prohibit any of that. <laughs> we don't say there are limits. Um, or it's easy to get around the limits. But one of the things that's happened basically with the Bernie Sanders campaign is that small donation funding for progressive candidates has proved to be, and partly this is over the, partly it's because of the rise of the internet too, um, has proved to be remarkably, it, it's even the, 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 the money spending fee, you know, field in a lot of races in the United States over, over recently. And I know, for, and, and there's all sorts of socially worthy projects and business ideas that have, that have successfully, you know, fundraised in this way. Um, so there's actually been a debate about whether this would be a good idea or a bad idea, or what the pros and cons of it are on equity grounds um, with um, on the, the participatory economy.org website. Um, because there's a lot of people that are interested in this. Sometimes crowdfunding basically allows the person who has donated to get a share of whatever comes out of it. So there's two kinds of crowdfunding. One is it's basically, it's just a donation. And the other is, no, you're actually buy in some sense, you're buying into the business. And at some point, you would get some reward for having done that. And those are two very different things in terms of what the equity implications are. It could also be implemented on a structural level, because when I was thinking about crowdfunding, it's not in the typical sense that you would have to take some of your money and put it into a crowdfunding um, a project or something like that. But it could be implemented in, on a structural level where each and everybody gets like a certain amount Uh, of tokens that you cannot spend for anything else, that those oh, okay. are associated with some form of, um, you know, fund for innovators who are kind of trying to, to test out new ideas and stuff like that. So this would be a slightly different uh, type of scheme. And one of the outputs for the people who uh, put in the tokens um, for, for a given project could be that they might simply get the use value that is being produced earlier than the others or something like that, you know, but this is uh, a side track, I would say. Yes. Yeah, I mean, when I was thinking of research, when I was thinking of workers counts, workers federations have been having large research enterprises that are affiliated with them. I was thinking of them funding that. Um, and I was thinking of the same thing on the consumer side. On the other hand, you could basically have The tokens could be basically tokens that individuals are saying, I want that research. I'm, I'm, I'm putting my token toward that research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And another question that I was asking myself uh, in terms of what you call user rights, how, how do you distribute user rights over a given commons so okay. that whoever can make the best use of the commons is actually allocated the, the right to use it because this is a difficult question. I mean, there might be many people who 
who propose to use a given commons that is uh, there okay. to use, and it's difficult to decide who might actually. Uh, well, I mean, get it. this is the same subject as well, public versus private ownership. So let's step back to sort of old socialist times. The first thing that the old socialists used to say is, well, the means of production need to be, the, the means of production shouldn't be in private hands. The means of production should be socially owned. And what kind of means of production were they thinking about? I mean, they were thinking about the factories and the machines in the factories. They shouldn't belong to the capitalist. You know, they should belong to all of the workers collectively. That means the economy still has to figure out how to assign a particular factory or a particular machine to be used by this group of workers or that group of workers. And that's what the plan supposedly does. Well, I mean, that also applies to land. I mean, land is like a machine. You use land to grow food. And in the Soviet Union, I mean, I was thinking the other day, I, you know, the, in the early Soviet Union, I mean, what actually produced the Russian Revolution was when the peasants actually took over the land. It was 80% of the population. There's no, Russia, there's no Russian Revolution except the peasants say, you know, the feudal lords who used to own the land and we worked on it for, as serfs and then we became free to serfs and we basically had to pay them rent. We're taking it over. And then they set up, sometimes they set up state farms. That was the form in which the land is public, was manifest. Sometimes they set up collective farms, which were somewhat different in terms of how the land was handled on a collective farm than a state farm. But certainly we have a sort of a history of socialists believe that that land and those factory and those machines, it's what I call part of the productive commons and it belongs to everybody and nobody. And the issue simply is figuring out who gets user rights over it on what sort of basis. And that's what the plan does. So if, I mean, you look at our, you look at our participatory planning process, and if you're a worker council and you're proposing to you know, produce so many tomatoes and so many heads of lettuce, then you're also saying, well, one of the inputs is we want this many acres of lands, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't want you to grow tomatoes on it if it would be better for avocados. And if there's another worker council that is wanting to land for avocados, then they're going to put in a proposal saying we want to use it. So <clears throat> that's, that's the importance of we want to know what the opportunity cost of using that land is because we want it to go. We want a system that will assign it to whichever workers council can make the most socially productive use of it. And I think that's part of that's part of what the planning process is actually doing. Now, there's another part of the productive commons that has been a lot trickier. So there was the traditional ideas of the machines in the factory. And that sort of extends to land. But there's also that, I mean, mainstream economists will call natural resources, they call them natural capital. So you have produced capital machines, buildings, you have natural capital, and then you have human capital. And human capital is sort of my native talents and my education and my training is what gives a particular person a certain amount of human capital. Well, should that be socially owned? Should we view that in the same way that we view the machines and the factories and the land and the natural capital as it belongs to everybody and nobody? No, it's me. I mean, it's mine. Well, How's that any different from the way people used to think of this land is mine, <laughs> this machine is mine? Um, that's the part I think that sort of both politically and philosophically and personally and psychologically becomes more difficult for people to think in the same terms. We have argued that it's all the same. And so we sort of said, it's all part of the productive commons. <laughs> 
and it doesn't belong to anybody or it, it belongs neither. It belongs both to all of us and none of us. And the question is simply how to use it and how in a planning procedure to award user rights over it. Um, there's, of course, a debate about, I mean, when you're thinking about compensation, there's been a long debate with the, among socialists about whether, well, if I have more human capital and therefore the social value of my contribution when I work an hour is higher than yours, then I deserve higher pay. And then there are people who've argued, no, that actually isn't, you don't deserve higher pay. You deserve higher pay if you made greater sacrifices, maybe, but not because, not simply because you have more human capital than somebody else. So those arguments have gone on forever among socialists. Um, and what it reduces to is whether or not human capital is, are we going to now consider human capital the same way we consider natural capital, the same way we, produ we consider produced capital as it belongs to all of us and none of us. It's, a collect it's something we collectively in our generation inherit from all those previous generations before us. And that's how it should be treated. And we want to design an economic system that treats it all that way. And that's been our vision and that's been our argument. But I know in terms of coming up, you know, I know that in terms of, of meeting opposition, from some fellow socialists about whether or not they agree or don't agree, that this is an area of this is an area of great disagreement. And when you think about it, of course we know it's an area of great disagreement. It was, I mean, it was hotly debated in the Soviet Union, you know, for 50 years, where there were time periods when, you know, there were big bonuses given out to people, you know, to engineers and people. I mean, one of Stalin's in the, in the early days, it was sort of, well, everybody gets paid the same and, you know, maybe we'll all argue about everybody's got to put in more effort and we'll fight with each other about you're slacking off and I, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no sort of, in the early days of the, of the Russian revolution, um, there wasn't strong support for the more highly educated and the engineers getting much higher pay scales. Whereas at some point during the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, that became, Gorbachev finally sort of voiced that as what socialism was. He literally said that we, we you know, people deserve to be paid according to the value of their social contribution. And some people's social contribution is objectively higher than other people. And it's perfectly fair that they be paid more and they should be paid more. Gorbachev finally arrived at the point of just saying that's what the that's the justification we're doing it and we should be doing it whereas i think that i would always have argued against that as being fair um and i think many socialists throughout history have also felt no that isn't particularly fair and just to check back whether or not i do get it right so like very specifically on the question of how it is being decided upon who gets user rights over a given commons. And you already explained that your notion of the commons is a very uh, like enlarged version of the commons, actually. Um, so the, the answer to the question of how this is being decided upon is, again, this question of social benefit. So whether or not a given uh, resource is actually being used in a way so that the social benefit uh, is higher than the social cost. And the way that this is being calculated is along the lines of opportunity costs. Do I get that right? Just to check it. Out. Yeah. I, I've I wrote an article where I talked about it as, um, I, I talked about it as, as the productive commons for modern times. I think there was a time period when socialists thought about the commons, they just thought about the machines in the factory and land. And now what we, I mean, modern times requires us to think about the productive column. So I'll list everything that's in the productive commons. It's, the, it's those machines in the factories, just like always. 
it's land, it's any other natural resources, including that big thing up there, you know, that is storing all our greenhouse gases, which is basically like a commons that whenever you use it and exploit it, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we need to take account of. Um, I think that everything that mainstream economists call human capital is part of the productive commons. And technology is part of the productive commons. And that's when we were talking about patent rights and who gets to use it. And then we were talking about it in the context of sort of stimulating innovation. But whatever techno whatever clever ways we have come up with making things in the past. So all of that is part of what I simply call the productive commons. And it doesn't belong any more to one person than another. But it's important that we, we want to allocate user rights over it to whoever can make the most efficient use of it. But nobody gets to reap the rewards personally of the fact that they're using it. So if we give the machines to the workers in this factory because that they can make you know the best use of them of that machine, that doesn't mean the workers in this factory get higher income than the workers in some other factory. Now, and here's the play, here's the real hard dividing line. So in our annual planning process we're gonna come up with the estimates of the opportunity cost of using an hour of electrical engineering labor. And we're gonna come up with the opportunity cost of using an hour of carpentry labor. And we're gonna come up with the opportunity cost of using an hour of just ditch digging labor. And they aren't gonna be the same. Now, does that mean that somebody in our economy that digs ditches or works as an electrical engineer or works as a carpenter is gonna get paid higher wages? And our answer is no. That'll be depending on inside their worker council, whatever procedures their fellow workers set up to decide whether they're you know, putting in extra effort, working extra hours, working under you know, more, less favorable or desirable conditions. So that that's the way that we've we we think there is we think there's a separate logic for how you allocate user rights over things, including different categories of labor that doesn't, but that doesn't have to for different categories of labor, it does not have to translate into that's how we therefore pay people differently. Which at a certain point in the early 1940s, Stalin was, you know, was just advocating. Um you know, for for the for for the those who were fortunate enough to get the engineering degrees and 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 have those skilled kinds of labor in the Soviet economy during that time period. The early I know the early years of the Cuban Revolution and when Che Guevara was still around, they were very clear on this point. That, and the Cubans always had an attitude about it. I mean, I it, their attitude about it in the early years in the Cuban revolution was we only have the resources to send so many, so many people to, to school to become doctors or to become engineers. And anybody that we sent to school doing that, they're already lucky. They're the ones that got the extra education and we couldn't give it to everybody. And they owe society. So the whole idea that you were lucky that you were the one that was trained to be a doctor we have every right to send you out to work for five years in the countryside, you know, giving, you know, making sure that little kids don't die from dehydration. I mean, that's fair. The idea that you deserve to be paid 10 times more than somebody who didn't get that extra education. In the early years of the Cuban revolution, there was a, there was a very broad consciousness. I, still, I think there still is in Cuba. A, a relatively healthy consciousness, I would call it, on this subject. I think before we move on to the more um, long-term questions, actually, I think it would be important 
maybe in order to close the the case of the basic elements of Paracon, to take a closer look at some elements we kind of touched upon but haven't yet really uh, talked through. One of those would be balanced job complexes because this is actually a, a very important basic principle within Paracon. Uh, as well and we haven't actually uh, laid it out in concrete terms i think so maybe could you explain uh, what are balanced job complexes and why do you think that they are a good idea to implement okay there's two different issues you can balance jobs in two respects one would be for empowerment And the other would be for desirability or undesirability, whatever. Um, so first, let's look at how it is that most jobs look in capitalism. We could also look and see how, how do most jobs look in the centrally planned socialist economies too. And in both cases, what you find is that a small, a small percentage of a workplace <clears throat> have jobs that consists of a number of tasks and sort of approximately how many hours a week you work in these different tasks. These are tasks where you're sitting in on meetings, you know, where you're going over different options for what the, you know, what might happen. Or these would be tasks where you're just, I worked, I used to work in steel mills when I was in the summers, when I was going to college. And they would throw us into the crews where We would have to go out and underneath the open hearth furnaces, all of this sort of burnt coal ash would come down. And at some point the, the, the tunnels would fill up and you have to send somebody in there to, to shovel it out into wheelbarrows. So, rote labor, not pleasant, um, nothing empowering about it. It just made your muscles sore when you went home at night. So in almost any capitalist workplace you go to, in, and I think in, in most places, in, in most of the centrally planned economies, certainly by, you know, the, the second half of the 20th century, what you're going to find is you've got a bunch of, you've got a small number of people who do managerial type tasks. And then you've got most of the people just carrying out somebody's orders, doing something that's more or less mind numbing. Well, clearly some tasks empower people to be both more knowledgeable about the kinds of decisions that have to be made in an enterprise and to sort of have the skills and habits to be effective in expressing their opinions on the subject. So the whole idea that, well, we want, we want our workers' councils, we're giving everybody one vote. Ultimately, we're saying, I mean, at a stockholders meeting in a capitalist corp in a capitalist corporation, ultimately you get as many votes as you have shares of stock. In a workers' council, everybody gets one vote. But if you have some people doing all of these empowering tasks day in and out, and you have other people in the workplace doing these rote, sort of mindless jobs day in and day out, then clearly although they have an equal right to vote in the meetings, you have, they aren't going to arrive at those meetings sort of equally empowered to be effective in the meetings. This is something that, I mean, that we, in, in Yugoslavia, um, we had a 20, 20, 30 year experience with worker self-management in enterprises. And one of the, I mean, there were, One of the very discouraging trends was that in the early years, there was a lot more active participation on the part of a much larger percentage of workers in the enterprise. And as time went on, participation, all the sociological studies about the activity of the participation declined over time. And I think there was a reason for that, that they didn't balance jobs for empowerment. They made no particular effort to do that. So if you really want what I would call real workplace democracy, rather than just formal, everybody gets one vote democracy, then there's a very strong argument that I think socialists should want to see 
job descriptions revised so that to the extent that it's reasonable and possible, you want to include empowering tasks along with disempowering tasks in everybody's job description. And does that mean that in a hospital, sometimes a surgeon might actually have to spend some hours changing bedpans? My answer is yes. <laughs> and then we can argue about whether that's a not a very efficient use of that skilled surgeon's time. Um, but in any case, so that's what that is. That, that's what the balancing for empowerment about. It's basically saying if you look at our, if you look at both capitalism and state socialism, um, there really was a remarkable similarity in terms of how jobs were structured and the fact that some of them, a small number of them were rather empowered, had the effect of empowering the people who carried out those tasks. And for most people, the effect was to disempower you in terms of your, in any case. Now that's a little different from desirability. So the argument in favor of empowering for desirability is that's how you encourage and make sure that you don't have an erosion of the exercise of economic democracy you know, in the workplaces. Balancing for desirability is an equity issue. And there is another way of taking care of that, and that is the workers' council. If you so, if, I mean, uh, where does that come from? Well, why would why should somebody's job be remarkably? Why should somebody's job be much more unpleasant than somebody else's job? Where's the justice in that? So you can put the question simply that way. Um, and my answer would be there is no justice in that, unless there was some compensation. So that's where there is sort of an alternative way to take care of the injustice if somebody's job has a whole bunch of tasks that are really unpleasant and somebody else's job never has any tasks that are unpleasant. The changing bedpans. In that case, you could compensate the person that has the job that is less pleasant to perform. And you could say that's part of why we... That's part of why somebody would deserve greater compensation. So in that case, there's two ways of taking care of it. Our actual proposal is, we basically propose consciousness raising amongst workers about these issues in their workplace. And we propose that we think you should set up, like we used to, originally we just called them effort rating committees, but we were thinking more along the lines of sort of any differential sacrifice. And we think you should set up procedures for trying to balance the tasks and the time people are spending in tasks so that you so that you you don't have this terrible imbalance in terms of their of the empowerment effects of work life. Um, but you obviously are going to have to go about this as you see fit. So these are what I call injunctions and arguments. Um, but the bottom line is nobody from the outside is coming in and telling you how you do it. And if push comes to shove and a workplace, a bunch of workplace council, I mean, a workers council doesn't want to do these things, I would be very loath to say somehow you get called up before a tribunal and, you know, put on trial for it. I mean, if you don't do them, you don't do them. In our mind, they're part of what socialism should be like and should be about. But we're very uh, libertarian in our anarchist tendencies in terms of whether this is something that is imposed or this is something that we are talking about building a culture for. Yeah, and I think uh, at least for me, this is this the the the, the last statements are very important uh, to me. I have to say because I'm not a big fan of the uh, effort rating committees to be, to be honest because i sense the real danger of this becoming real ugly and uh, creating some form of toxic workplace and i would very much advise uh, anyone to not go this road but i very much appreciate that within paracon you give this uh, kind of flexibility uh, in order to 
approach the things that you recommend in the terms of, um, for example, balance jobs com job complexes or effort rating committees. But if a worker council does have a different type of culture within the given worker council and wants to do things differently, this is absolutely compatible with Paracon as such, as I understand it. Well, there's the largest actual experience of a group of workplaces trying to apply these principles, including, and in particular, the job balancing. Um, the ba balancing for both empowerment and balancing for, you know, for desirability and effort rating. Um, there was a, a whole network of, they were called the Mondragon, it was called the A-Zone. And, and they were called the Mondragon, not to, not to be confused with the Mondragon cooperatives in the Basque region of Spain. And I'm not quite sure why they chose, I think they might have chose the word Mondragon and Winnipeg in sort of honor of that, but they're very, very different. And there was a coffee house, a restaurant, um, a radio station, a bicycle repair, a sort of a delivery business. And they all were in this sort of, they all had offices in this sort of building that they, that they jointly had. And, and they, they very self-consciously tried to operate their collectives on the basis of pair recon principles. Um, and they did it for about 20 years. Um, and so I'm aware of debates and discussions that went on amongst them. Um, one of the founders, Paul Burroughs, um, has gone on to do some other things, but he now is, he's now been active back on the forum on the participatoryeconomy.org website discussing exactly this thing. Because it is one of the things that has been most controversial. And I can say that what Mondragon ended up doing was not really trying to do any sort of detailed effort rating. They argued about it a lot. It was quite controversial. And they ended up they 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 ended up saying, no, it's going to come down to ours. And if there's a real problem with just you know, you're not putting in effort, then then it's an issue of firing. You know, it's, a, it's an issue of the rest of us saying this is just too detrimental to the rest of us. You either have to ship up or you, you have to shape up or you really shouldn't be working here anymore. Rather than sort of having an effort rating committee where at the end of every six months or, or so. So I know that's what they came up with. Um, I am sure that Here's my dilemma. My dilemma is the following. Those of us who are even talking about it, we're already, we've already decided that we're, we're leftists and we're socialists. And therefore, we don't think it should be necessary to get into this kind of invidious comparisons. And we would just find it toxic. And my answer to all of us is I have two, and I have two, two things to say about that. Just like you, when I go to search for a workers' council to work for in a participatory economy, I will look for one that adopts that attitude toward effort rating. Because that'll, that'll make me happiest there. I mean, one of the things that people should look at, I mean, people do this in capitalism. They look to see, well, what's your pay structure and how are you going to, when can I first put in for, you know, for, for a promotion? So I think one of the things that people will sensibly look at in a participatory economy when they decide where they want to apply to a workplace is to look and see what is the workplace's procedures in this regard or the ones I would like or the ones I would feel comfortable with or not. But here's my dilemma. I talk to people who would not be comfortable in a work environment where they think that people who don't work as hard are gonna get just as rewarded as they are. And I know that they would want some sort of procedures where, where slackers would be identified by fellow workers and would be told, look, it's okay if you don't wanna work as hard. 
but please recognize that that means you shouldn't be rewarded quite as much. So that's another issue. And the usual way of handling this, I mean, the way it was always handled in the Soviet Union was everybody should be working harder than anybody can imagine. And I mean, I grew up as an, I, I grew up as enough of a hippie to know that is insane. That's not a good life. So there's nothing wrong with somebody saying, hey, you want to go out there and bust your hump? That's fine. I don't have to do that. I don't want to, ch I don't choose to do that. On the other hand, I think one should concede that if somebody else is making more sacrifices, then they deserve some degree of extra compensation that's commensurate with that. And it is my personal choice. So I want to give people the person, I want to preserve personal choice over how much effort people put into work. But I think there's a responsible way to do that, which is I choose more. I mean, we know there's a sort of choose between leisure and income, but we think of it as in terms of hours. You can also choose between leisurely pace of work and income. And there's no reason people shouldn't make, people should have the right to choose that. They make that choice for themselves, why not? There's nothing socially irresponsible about saying I want a more leisurely pace of work. But my more leisurely pace of work, I think, basically entitles me to what I'm saying is I want that more leisurely pace of work. And yes, I accept somewhat less compensation for the fact that it's not as big a, a sacrifice as somebody else is making. So that, that's, that's where that all has landed. In the end, we leave it up to workers' councils. We recommend that people take that into consideration when you decide where to apply to work. You want to you wanna go to work someplace where they have the same values on that, where they've come to the same set of values on that subject that you feel are, that, that you're comfortable with. But I do know that there are people out there who are very loath to think that this system would be a good system that they would be happy in. If they could, they imagine themselves working in a place where they work hard and other people don't. And the other people get away with it and get paid the same as them. And they find that something, oh, well, I, I don't like that system. And I, I think there's, there, there's a point to be made there too. I also think there's, a, I also think there's a, a real bias. Those of us who even talk about this clearly are more inclined to don't want to get into it. People will be responsible. And if they're really irresponsible, then, you know, you admonish them, you know, in some sort of way, you give them a warning. And finally, you just say, well, you don't really, you, you just don't want to, the rest of us don't want to work with you. But I think that, that there's a real, I, I think that leftists are predictably farther in that direction than your average person out there in the population that we talk to about different economic systems. Because I, I know I know this reaction from students in my classes. Because students in my classes are basically the average U.S. population in some sense. They're, you know, a tiny percentage of them are leftists. And and I know from their reaction over the years, um, they find it comforting that there be procedures to distinguish between, you know, people who are working hard and people who aren't. Yeah, I I think I subsume this. Also, uh, somehow under the, the question of transition, because the, the way that you approach it by providing a plurality of approaches to different um, people who might be in, in a different like, state of mind towards these questions so that they can like, build it in a, in a way that works for them for the moment. I mean, this also includes some danger of course in in the sense that it might lead to structures that reproduce this kind of thinking that you just described from your students this kind of uh, like a bit greedy and competitive type of behavior or thinking about uh, one another and there's this danger of like reproducing this by producing uh, institutions and structures within a given work and workers council that that 
as I said, produces this kind of thinking as well. But I, as I said, I absolutely appreciate this pl plurality and uh, my vote would go out for not <laughs> um, like going down the route of um, effort rating committees. And also in, 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 in terms of sacrifice and effort, I find it very difficult to really evaluate whether or not someone is putting in effort or not, because this could look very differently for a different uh, type of person and at some point within your newest book you also write but are people equally able to sacrifice or is it easier for some to make sacrifices than it is for others just as it is easier for some to perform difficult and valuable physical or mental tasks than it is for others and then you state questions such as these make me happy i'm not a philosopher what can one say except perhaps and and quote and i would add to this perhaps i would say for sure i'm quite sure that it is actually impossible to really evaluate whether someone is putting in effort or not and some to some people it comes more naturally uh, at different things and to others not so i would actually be kind of skeptical but as i said <laughs> i highly appreciate this this flexibility within within your approach so there's, a, there's actually a very active debate on um in amongst the collective that that manages the actually one of the two brothers who are the most active managers of the website um jason raised that on the discussion forum and said that he thinks that There's a discussion about whether we should stop using the word effort in this regard. Yeah, but it's it's not an easy issue. It's not an easy issue. And it and it is one that people care tremendously about. And it's also one where you don't, it's also one where, I mean, when we're starting to talk about opportunity costs and social costs, and you know, whether a planning mechanism will do this or that, well, there you I mean, there it requires some expertise. This isn't any subject that anybody feels requires any expertise they don't have, which I, I always appreciate a subject where everybody thinks that they are equally equipped to, to argue and debate and their view is just as valid as anybody else. I think it's lucky when we have a subject where everybody thinks that way about it. Um, and I think this is one of those subjects. Everybody has a very firm opinion about what they think is fair and not fair in terms of economic compensation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. One one question that I'm that, that I have in the back of my mind all of the time when you're talking about like the the ways in which these workers' councils are organized internally, how you might achieve um, self management and so on and so forth, is the question of scaling. So. How big can these councils actually become in order to stay true to these principles that you would like to see being enacted within uh, these worker councils? Because people who have experiences with self-organized structures, they might know that this is very much difficult. It's very, very difficult to achieve like organizations of scale that are actually really true to principles uh, that Perrican tries to promote. So, so what is the, how do you think about this okay. question of scale? The simple answer is we're agnostic on that subject, but that doesn't mean there, there seem to be some things that clearly the smaller the workers council the easier it is you know, for people, for everybody to participate in all aspects. So, so you can look, you can ask yourself, is there an optimal size just in terms of how would participatory democratic decision-making procedures function best? Um, obviously from a technology production side, there's also issues about scale. And here there's a, there's a useful difference. I mean, economists talk about true economies of scale, which can be distinguished from financial economies of scale. So in a capitalist economy, there are frequently advantages of being larger, like being an oligopoly or a monopoly even. Not necessarily because the technology dictates it, 
So we wouldn't want workers' councils to become large for what in capitalism would be financial economies of scale reasons, but in terms of social costs and lowest social cost of production, there are true economies of scale um, where probably the efficient size for a steel worker, a workers' council producing steel is different from you know, the, the efficient size for a workers' council that's a haircut salon. So, but when I said we're agnostic, we just, we recognize all that. And we don't think, I mean, so suppose you have a workers' council where true economies of scale are significant. And so we're really talking about an enterprise that makes sense, um, you know, that has a couple of thousand members. Well, then you clearly would have to sort of, you're going to have different divisions. I mean, something that large is going to have different, I mean, in a steel mill, there was the, there's the blast furnace. There's the open hearth furnace, you know, there's the warehouses, there's the, there's the sheet metal cutting places. So there's all these sort of divisions. And in a large enterprise, you would want to have sort of sub worker councils, you know, for the different divisions. There's a whole bunch of decisions in the blast furnace area that really don't affect the rest of the plant that much. But it seems like that, I mean, so that is our approach. That's, that, that would be the sensible way to approach that. Um, the only thing that should not come into play are in capitalist economies, financial economies of scale sometimes give you extra market power advantages. And that's why a firm will get that big. And certainly, and, and we don't think that any workers council you know, Mondragon set up operations in China and the Chinese operation was not self-managed by Chinese workers at the Mondragon place in China. So we, that's verboten. That you can't have. Um, so you're not, I mean, a lot of the world's large corporations are now global. And so we're not talking about that at all. None of these worker councils are operating outside of the country. In in general, so there there would not be any. Well, they can export. They can export. They can import. I mean, there's a chapter in the last in in democratic economic planning that that addresses the sort of new practical issue. Do we? There was a point in time when socialists thought that when socialism finally came to power any place, the idea was going to be so obviously wonderful that the workers were going to revolt every place and we were going to have socialism everywhere. Even Lenin thought there were going to be revolutions in Germany and Europe and that we were, they weren't going to have an isolated Soviet Union. And Trotskyists for a long time argued that you really can't have socialism in one country. Well, it's apparent now that if we can't have socialism in one country at a time, we're never going to have it because at this point in the 20th century, it's very clear to me that it's highly unlikely that we aren't going to have, who knows whether what country it's going to be, but countries are going to try and become socialist in a world where there are still huge differences in levels of economic development and where a lot of the countries are capitalist countries that they have to interact with. And then the question is, how do you interact? So we finally addressed that in the most recent book. We'd never talked about it before um, and sort of proposed how could a socialist, a country with a socialist economy, take part in international trade in a way that was beneficial to them, but didn't violate their fundamental principles in some way that eroded the, the sort of moral and political glue that held their system together. And we basically said the one thing that's ruled out is direct foreign investment. You can't allow a capitalist firm coming and come into a participatory economy and set up a capitalist, engage in direct foreign investment, run as a capitalist firm inside the socialist economy. And we said we don't think workers' councils in the socialist economy can basically do direct foreign investment abroad. But we do think that 
There's no reason that a, that a participatory economy couldn't trade with the rest of the world, um, including trading with capitalist countries and including taking into account dramatic differences in levels of economic development in terms of the terms of trade. And even international financial investment is something we think is possible for, for a participatory economy to engage in. That a participatory economy could engage in international financial investment, both outgoing and ingoing. It's a question of, it's a question of how you treat the interest rate. And with certain partners, you have to treat the interest rate differently. But that's not something that wasn't discussed. I mean, there was a huge discussion when, when Cuba used to lecture the Soviet Union and the Eastern European economies about the morality of the difference between being a lesser developed country and a more developed country. I mean, Che Guevara was famous for just saying, well, we assume that your socialist principles, you know, will help you understand why you should afford favorable terms of trade towards your brother socialist Cuban economy. Now, to some extent, the Soviet Union did do that but more for geopolitical purposes than commitments to socialist principles. But in any case, this isn't something that hasn't been discussed before. But I do think that among socialists in 2020, that discussion now has to be, we now have a new perspective realism about how socialism will eventually come to the world. It'll come a little here and a little there, and there's a long period of time where you have to have some sensible answers to how do those countries in, you know, interact in economic, how, how, how do they engage in, inter, in, in economic interactions with other countries? You've got to have a more sensible discussion of that than we've ever had before. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories. Or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.